All right, I'm now speaking with uh, Juma Muhammad. Uh, all right, Mr. Muhammad, we just not had a chance to meet here recently. We're in South Bend here. What brought you to South Bend? I was invited by the University of Notre Dame at their Black Man's Think Tank to talk about unlocking your potential. And I understand that um, you were also involved with Br Brother Sage. How did you and he meet? Brother Sage and I met almost 40 years ago. He was a high school counselor. He inspired me, motivated me, redirected my life, and put me on the track towards attending Central State University and uh, becoming a role model and a mentor for my community. Now, I understand that you're from Ferguson, Missouri. What was it like years ago when you were growing up there, and how has it changed to present day? Ferguson has pretty much, uh, well, initially it was an all-white community, and over time it became very brown and very black, meaning African-American uh, African -American people moved into the community. Uh, however, the uh, politics of the city and the police force remain predominantly all white, probably 99% white, maybe one Hispanic. And so when the incident with Michael Brown over the past year and a half, two years, occurred, we saw this racial disparity and racial, uh, racial confrontation with Darren Wilson where this young African-American male was shut down, shot down um, as a result of uh, that, that exchange with the officer. Now, if the Michael Brown incident would not have happened, were there the dynamics there such that something else would have happened? Sooner or later, something would have happened. And I think Ferguson is indicative of most communities throughout the country where whites have left the community and blacks have moved in. However, the power structure has remained the same. And so as we see around the country with the uh, case of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and Tamir Rice, uh, most of those communities are predominantly all white as well where black people are underrepresented and don't receive the proper justice that is due to them as citizens of those communities. So then is that problem, is, is a problem in Ferguson, is that correctable? It is uh, correctable, however, uh, systemic change, it takes a while and it takes time to uh, reshuffle the deck, so to speak, and move some of those bad apples out and put the kind of people in there that are going to provide leadership regardless of race or ethnicity. And so the case of uh, Ferguson is going to take time, and it is slowly moving in a direction where there's a sense of balance in the community. All right. Did that environment that more or less condition you, did that have any impact on you going into the area of psychology? That incident uh, did not have any bearing on me. Uh, I went into psychology initially uh, when I attended Central State University. I majored in pre-med. And I went to school to become an ophthalmologist. And the way that happened is because as a kid, I was hit in the eye with a baseball, and I became intrigued by the medical equipment after going to uh, get my eyes checked. And uh, consequently, as an athlete, uh, a high jumper, running track and playing basketball, uh, pre-med was a little difficult, so I decided to uh, move into the area of psychology. My mentor, Brother Sage, had had a background in counseling and psychology and work with youth. And so it was a nice segue into that particular arena. And I found a sense of comfort and degree and uh, anything that deals with the mind and challenging the mind and understanding human behavior and social dynamics intrigues me. And so it was a natural fit. Initially, when you first uh, started counseling or, or interfacing with people, especially young people, black people, what uh, dynamic stood out in your mind as to made your bells go off to see to say that there's a problem here? Excellent question. Um, probably the common thread in most situations, families, uh, the family dynamics is the uh, lack of knowledge itself. And that's a really uh, profound statement and it has deep meaning. Uh, however, when an individual or family does not know themselves or know who they are or know from whence they come, then it's like um, you're moving south when in reality you should actually be going north or vice versa. And so when we talk about knowledge itself, we talk about having that cultural framework or that, that personal and cultural foundation to know who you are, to know your greatness, and to know uh, what you're capable of. There's an axiom that says 
Those who fail to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat the same mistakes time and time again. And so it's, it's not an accident that Black History Month is the shortest month of the year. And it's no accident that uh, the information that we get from Black History Month is very minimal. And so when the people don't know who they are, it's very problematic for them. Okay, now when you say we don't know, we don't know who we are, you're referring strictly to African history and, um, or are you talking about slavery? What exactly are you in reference to? I'm talking about the combination of everything. You know, it's very important to know our history and to know about those who took our history from us. Very, very important. So we're not just talking about the slavery aspect of it. We're talking about the great empires, the great kings and queens. And again, you know, foundation is, is built upon one's history and one's legacy. And so the more that we know about ourselves and our people, our rich history and our rich culture, it, it gives you a sense of empowerment because you know, you know what's possible. Okay, so what happened where today, when you mention history to a lot of people, their ears fold over forward, they don't want to hear anything about it? Well, you have to understand that most people have been programmed. And, you know, as, as a lecturer and a motivational speaker, I travel throughout the country. And one of the examples that I give whenever I'm talking to a large group of people is that if I took a, a picture of the entire group, and I showed it to each individual in the group. The first person that I, the first thing that a person would do in the group would be to look for themselves. They want they want to know if they're presentable. Well, it's the same thing with history. When our young people go to school and learn about them, their history, or when they go to school to take a history class, if they don't see themselves represented in history, then there's a disconnect, and so there's no motivation to be inspired to learn about history. But I've found in my personal private practice and working with young people, the more that they know about their history and their culture, it inspires them. It lets them know about the human realm of possibility of what they could become. So in terms of social engineering, is there a difference? I mean, you've had a chance to travel not only, you know, I guess, around the country here and around the world. Is there any difference, in speaking of the United States here, uh, from one region to another, the difference in the programming? Because a lot of people have said that that black communities or the mindset is messed up everywhere. Um, I would say there are different degrees of being messed up. Uh, in some instances in the South where racism is more prevalent, people tend to have a greater sense of awareness and a collective need to get together and, and support each other. Uh, oftentimes in the, in the Midwest or in the North, people tend to be a little bit more uh, liberal and um, in some instances believe that racism is a thing of the past. And so they're a little bit less aware about uh, the global aspects of white supremacy and racism. When we talk about racism, we're not necessarily talking about an individual. We're talking about a system that supports uh, racist practices and racist policies. Uh, there's a brother by the name of Neely Fuller who said that until you understand the global aspects of racism and the various tentacles that it touches, everything else you think you understand, you'll never understand it. So we're talking about a system versus an individual. A lot of people that I've had a chance to speak with have said that if you stop talking about racism, that it'll it, that the impact on individual will diminish and uh, i found that a lot of times when you try to explain the opposite of that you're kind of just blowing smoke in the air how do you get that point across that regardless of what you do you a lot of times you cannot run that impact of global or even local or regional ever how you want to look at it that's an excellent question uh, i have two words for that barack obama and the reason I say Barack Obama is, you know, we're taught in this country as people of color or African-Americans to go to school, to acquire this education, to learn how to speak properly or proper, to learn how to dress in a certain kind of way that is acceptable to mainstream America. If you look at the first family in the White House right now, Barack Obama and his wife, uh, both of them are Ivy League educated. And as president of the United States, he, he still does not receive the respect that is due to him. And even around the country, around the world, in different European countries particularly that he go to, they will defame him and use uh, monkey caricature 
or images to uh, show their disdain for a black man being in a position of power and leadership. And so, you know, when people say, well, just stop talking about racism, it'll go away. You know, two more words, Serena Williams, because she dominated the tennis world. They, they too continue to do the same kinds of things to demean the young lady as opposed to giving her the proper respect that is due to her as a world champion. And so there's a critical need that we have to continue to talk about this. You know, two other words, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner. It is because of their race and their ethnicity that they become victims of this system here. You know, you said something there. I remember reading an article where it said that when you elect Trump to be president, you'd be bringing class back to the White House to the first lady. And they were comparing Donald Trump's wife to Michelle Obama. And they had a picture of Michelle standing right there and had a picture of Trump's wife naked. But yet they still feel that she's a more classy person. How, and they can sell it because when you, when you read the comments, a lot of people responded in a positive way. And uh, you can, that's kind of hard to combat, isn't it? You know, the interesting thing about the rise of Donald Trump is that, um, you know, when Barack Obama was running for president, everybody wanted to know if he was qualified. They wanted to know if he had enough education. Did he have enough experience? Was he articulate enough? Well, Barack Obama has demonstrated all of that and beyond. Now we see Donald Trump, who's inarticulate, very coarse, very uh, abusive, verbally abusive to women, minorities, uh, has a disdain for most people that don't uh, uh, support his ideology, has a psychopathic personality. And so to uh, put his wife up as a... As a uh, measure of beauty or what have you, uh, to me is just, is not even worth giving the energy to. You know, Michelle Obama has demonstrated nothing but class to all women regardless of, of race and ethnicity. She's uh, been an advocate of uh, health and wellness, and she's been a classy first lady from the day that she's taken office. So I don't even see any comparison. To give this uh, conversation would be a waste of energy. There's no comparison. You know, in terms of social engineering, I've read where I, I want to reference the Willie Lynch letter here for a moment. Now, it said that if, now I know that we don't need to go into that, but I know that it, it's a myth and but what have you, but it says that if the curse, so to speak, isn't broken within 300 years, that the slave mentality mindset would become perpetual. And one can argue that that's the case almost today. Well, it's the case, and it will always be the case until we develop a sense of enlightenment and awareness and culture. We have to become, as African Americans, unapologetically black and develop an African center uh, frame of, of uh, reference. Uh, that's the only way that we're, we're going to be able to survive in America. America is racist to the core. America was founded on racism. That's America benefits from racism. But the interesting thing about other ethnic groups, they're able to survive and even thrive because they have that cultural unity. That cultural unity is a sense of glue that keeps them together as a community. So regardless of who the next politician or president is, they continue to thrive. And so when you take African-Americans and you strip them of their history, the knowledge of who they are, uh, you, you uh, take away their culture and demean them and use social and psychological engineering to create a, a paradigm within them that keeps them confused. And this is not an excuse. It's the reality that we uh, were uh, subjected to. And so until we develop that sense of awareness and continuity and culture, then we'll, we'll all we'll continue to be confused. Okay, now, that's gone on for since the inception of slavery or colonization of the Americas. The work that you're doing, during to, the work that you are doing today with younger people, black people, how is that having an impact on reversing that mindset? Uh, the way I see it, having... Uh, a positive impact is that, you know, God blessed me uh, by not having a father in the home. 
uh, and meeting a brother by the name of Brother Sage and a couple other very positive brothers that provided me with a sense of direction and purpose, uh, I utilized those tools and started an organization called the Association of African American Role Models. The program lasted for 20 years. Over 30,000 young people came through the program. 75% of them went on to do well. And the basis of their success, they attribute to having an understanding of their culture, a sense of identity, a sense of purpose. And it, it, uh, it pushed them towards the direction that God had intended for them to go in. They just needed to be reconnected with their culture. Malcolm X is an excellent example of that, the transformation. You know, he was called uh, Dirty Red, and even in prison they used to call him Satan. And he was considered one of the most wayward individuals. Uh, sold drugs and all kinds of uh, um, uh, unacceptable kinds of things. Uh, but as a result of, in, in his understanding, finding God and a sense of direction, he totally transformed his life. And when he went to prison, he studied and read every book in the library and, you know, died one of the most respected men on, on the planet Earth. And so change is definitely possible with the understanding of self. So is the understanding of self that self-correcting mechanism that you always hear about where you can keep something dumb only so long, then you know, the, the organism will correct itself. Well, it doesn't necessarily correct itself. You know, something can stay perpetually dumb for as long as time immemorial. It doesn't make any difference. However, that self-knowledge that we we're talking about becomes a corrective healing. It becomes therapeutic to a sick mind. You know, when a person doesn't know who they are or from whence they come, then they can be socially engineered in any direction, any direction that you uh, want to take them in. There's a psychologist by the name of John B. Watson, and he came up with the, uh, the uh, clean slate or clean glass theory where he talked about through social engineering and environmental input and effect, that they could create a scientist, they could create a doctor, they could create somebody with purpose, and by the same token, they could even create a criminal if that was the intended goal. And so it just depends on those environmental effects and who, who's doing the leading, and they can lead you in any uh, particular direction. So self-knowledge becomes a healing bomb because you know it gives you that center of gravity, that foundation, that personal direction that you need. But you just said two different things, and that's pretty important. Uh, when you said that you can create whatever you want to create by manipulating jobs or bringing drugs in or changing laws, you can uh, steer people into criminality by limiting their options and increasing the populations in prisons. And uh, that's, uh, um, isn't what you just said dependent upon the honesty of the government? or the people who are in control of the societies? Well, the government doesn't have to have as much of an impact as we allow it to have. Uh, the government has its own agenda. The government has its own national interest that it works to protect on a daily basis. However, you can take an uh, individual that comes from a great home and they still end up becoming a drug addict or a criminal. So it goes back to self-knowledge, the knowledge that that person has in relationship to the creator or whoever they deem to call God. And so those things are, are very, very important. You know, the interesting thing about the school system, when our young people go to school, they learn about science and math and social studies, but they never really learn about themselves, the good, the bad, the ugly, or the things that need changing. And so the greatest knowledge is self-knowledge. You know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to say that all the time, that the greatest knowledge was self-knowledge. And once a man learned about himself or a woman learns about uh, herself, the rest is history because they begin to understand the potentiality that they possess. So you're saying that a person can be successful or, or they can uh, mature intellectually even within a system of white supremacy? Absolutely. You know, and th this is a, a, a unique little caveat. You know, you can go to the American school system and do well academically get your uh, degrees and so on and so forth and still have a sense of uh, racial self-hatred. Condoleezza Rice is probably the best example of that. Clarence Thomas is probably the next best example of that. And the list goes on and on. 
you know, these are individuals that went to Ivy League schools and so on and so forth, but have no real meaningful contribution or adoration for the African-American community from whence uh, they come. And so just because you're formally educated doesn't mean you have a sense of consciousness or connection to your community. And so I, I go back to the, my initial point, self-love, your culture. Your culture is the base, basis of who, who you are and how you d define yourself. Well, what I've noticed is from the time that, let's say, we were in high school or I was in high school, not high school, but middle school, we had Afro clubs. Those are all gone. And black schools are all gone. And all the things that I uh, gave a kid a sense of cultural identity are gone. Afro clubs turned into multicultural clubs and things like that. What are the communities, not the individual, but the uh, bodies within the black community, do you see uh, that they have to step up their game or is it, or still, if it's, is it just totally up to the individual and if he enlightens himself, he'll rise above those other obstacles anyway? Well, a person doesn't know what they don't know and they usually won't know it until somebody tells them or instruct them or show them. And so it goes beyond the individual. Uh, it, it goes to the, those of us who develop a sense of consciousness. I believe we have a personal and a social responsibility to give to others uh, because somebody intervened in my life some 35 years ago. I'm able to stand before you and uh, provide this interview. God has blessed me to touch the lives of thousands of people throughout the world. And so one man can truly make a difference. And so I think it's, an, it's incumbent upon those of us who've developed that sense of consciousness and awareness to give back to others because our community is hurting individually, emotionally, psychologically, and personally. And so when older individuals are able to provide personal direction for the young people, then that gives them an opportunity to uh, get on the right track and move forward. Okay, as you're winding down here, I have to ask you this one more question here. After all these years of working in this area and trying to achieve the objectives with younger blacks, have you ever just want to throw your hands up and say, this is not going to work and just want to walk away from it? And if not, how did you stick with it? Well, you know, uh, I I've never uh, had that sentiment because I'm motivated by the infinite possibilities of life. And I think about if somebody would have given up on me, uh, I would not have been blessed to touch the lives of thousands of people. And when I think about what our ancestors, I don't call them slaves, but our ancestors, when I think about what they had to endure, so my day-to-day -day struggles are in no way uh, uh, in comparison to what they underwent. And so when I compare and contrast the two, I don't have any reason to be tired. You know, this work is just starting for me, and there's so much more work to be done. And then we have to understand that, you know, we're born in the world to die, but it's what we do while we're here. And there's so many uh, lives that need to be touched, so many lives that haven't been touched. And so I'm no ways tired. I'm motivated. I'm excited about life. Um, I pray that God will continue to give me additional years to assist and help others. I was blessed to be at the University of Notre Dame this past weekend at, uh, for the Black Man's Think Tank. And I consider myself planting seeds. You know, when you plant a seed, it doesn't necessarily uh, come up the next day. It doesn't germinate the next day. However, it may be some years past that it germinate and those individuals that you talk to will come and see you somewhere and say, hey, Brother Muhammad, hey, man, I remember what you said to me. And I used to be a high school teacher and a principal years ago. And I see some of my students, and they come up to me and they say, hey, Mr. Mama, you really changed my life. Hey, you was the father figure that we never had. You was the role model. You may not have realized we were looking at you, but we were watching your example. And your example spoke volumes to us. And th therefore, I'm motivated, and I too have become a teacher or a superintendent. And so we can't afford to be tired. It's too much work to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. I pray that others will see this video and be inspired and motivated. And I want everybody to understand that one man slash one woman can make all the difference in the world. Our young girls are struggling with body image issues and how society has 
defined them and made them feel less than. And the same thing with our young African-American males, our boys. You know, when I was growing up, I used to hear this very, neg uh, very negative statement about one in four young black boys being um, caught up in the penal system, probation, or on parole. And they tell me it's one in three now. And so I can't afford to be tired when there's so many youthful and young possibilities out there that need direction or redirection. And I take pride in being a role model. I take pride in being a father to my children and, you know, all those children who I can't be a father to, I strive to be a role model for them. You know, one thing I've learned in life, you know, uh, two most important things in life, the day you're born and the day you figure out what your purpose is. And so my purpose is to inspire, to motivate, to teach our young people about entrepreneurship, leadership, service to the community. And so I'm no ways tired. I'm excited. I appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure's been mine. Thank you for watching.